Welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 124 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 50 of A Clash of Kings, that's Theon 4. Chapter 50, we're making our way. I think my audiobook says we're 76% of the way through, and that includes the appendices, which we won't be discussing. Anyway... As always, we'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we'll provide you with some entertainment along the way. We'll summarize what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll provide you some additional information that will be particularly helpful if you're not reading along. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing well. Y- you know... Carson's uh, rule about thunder in the winter means snow within ten days. Uh huh. Held true. Did it? Yeah. I don't. I remember the snow, but I didn't remember the thunder in advance of the snow. At least we heard some. Penny certainly did. She was hiding yeah. in the uh, in Molly's bathtub. That's where she goes when she hears thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and so sure brave. enough, it, it went from uh, two days ago. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, walking the dog, and yesterday it was snowing. So yeah, it did. It, it snowed quite a bit. Yeah, Very exciting. We're at the uh, beginning of this is our first episode of 2022, right? That's yeah. right. It is indeed. Yes. H- how are Happy you? New Year to you. As the same to you. I haven't oh, asked. Okay. You. Yeah. I'm okay. I I I discovered that you published an episode without consulting me. <laughs> I did, which is rather <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Our outtakes. The the last episode <laughs> of 2021. <laughs> mm-hmm. I uh, I didn't know my singing was going to make it to... The, I would have practiced a bit harder. <laughs> Anything you put on these airwaves has a chance. Uh, <laughs> my my brother Rob is getting married. Oh, wow. Congratulations, Rob. Yeah. I saw that on the show notes. I wondered if, if maybe you meant Rob was marrying a fray. No, I see what you mean. Yes, no. <laughs> my brother Rob. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is, always reminds me to get my taxes done when Rob announces he's getting married, because usually that's the reason. <laughs> I'm being mean. <laughs> You're an older brother. Rob, You're expected to be mean. <laughs> I wish Rob and Sophie all the best. They're Absolutely. They're, they're, they're a great couple, and I wish them well. Uh, yeah. So uh, what did you think of the outtakes? Did they make you chuckle? They, Of course they make me chuckle. I mean, <laughs> everything we do makes me chuckle. But yeah, they were. I enjoyed them. I put out on our uh, social media pages, which made you laugh harder, Simon singing or my inability to pronounce half-hand Half hand, half hand. <laughs> and uh, what I said about that was, you just in that episode where you said half hand, you'd just been talking about Molly playing an old lady in right. a play. Yes, and, and so I commented on that. You sounded like Molly, <laughs> half hand, half hand. <laughs> yeah, although uh, me uh, saying that. Uh, Bran was quilting in the yard. Sure got a pretty, oh, pretty was... ruckus laugh from us. Do you remember what you were supposed to say? Was it like tilting at the yes. quatrain or something yes, like that? Yes, that's exactly what it was. I said and he you was were quilting. quilting. <laughs> that still makes me laugh. Oh, good uh, stuff. Anyway, hopefully you've gotten a chance to check it out. If you haven't yet, go yeah. check out our outtakes. They're pretty fun. We've, 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 we've just summarized them for right, you there. That's, about, that's the best of them. That was the highlights. <laughs> Uh, so yes beginning of 2022 so let's get off to a good show here yeah let's go down to business where was theon last we heard of him so last we saw of theon he was capturing winterfell by drawing sir roderick cassell out to defend torrens square his reign of as lord of winterfell began inauspiciously when the smith micken is murdered in front of everyone and the kennel master's daughter pala is abused by the ironborn uh, Reek and Osha, the wildling, at least seem keen to switch sides to Team Theon. McKelly, why don't we give them the summary of this one? All right. Theon wakes suddenly and can't decide if a sound or his dream stirred him. He leaves Kyra, a local girl, in bed while he goes to the window. He's grimly pleased to be bedding the girl in Ned's own chambers. He relishes the insult to the straight-laced former owner. The night air is cool, but all is quiet. He returns to bed, stepping over his squire Wex. Dawns on him that the silence is the problem. The direwolves have been howling incessantly since the fall of Winterfell, but they're quiet now. 
He jumps up and sends his guard Urzen to check on the direwolves in the godswood, and sends Wex to check that Bran and Rickon are where they ought to be. First to return is Wex. The princes are gone. Theon dresses hurriedly. Urzen then returns and unsurprisingly reports that the wolves are gone too. Mm -hmm. Once again, the occupants of Winterfell are ordered to gather up before their new lord. Theon wants to see who is missing. While the people are being roused from their beds, Theon and company find where the escape happened. Squint and Drennan were guarding the hunter's gate. Both are dead, the former floating in the moat, with clear signs that he was mauled by Summer and Shaggy. The latter is in the guardhouse with his pants down and a slit throat just below his smiling face. Theon returns to the main yard where Reek reveals that Osha, Hodor, and the Reeds are all missing too. Theon recognises Osha's handiwork in the murder of Drennan. The wildling has no morals and lies with impunity. Nobody will provide any help to Theon. Reek suggests using his old master's technique of flaying a few of them. Theon takes the opportunity to ingratiate himself by announcing that there will be no flaying while he's Lord of Winterfell. How benevolent. No horses have been stolen, so Theon reckons that they can wait for daylight before chasing the fugitives. He rounds up a few volunteers of various levels of willingness, from Walter Frey, who's keen on the idea of hunting humans, to Farland, the kennelmaster, who's coerced by further threats to his daughter. Maester Lewin is also invited. As they ride, the hounds have no trouble following the wolves' trail. Lewin takes the opportunity to sue for clemency with Theon. Greyjoy reassures Lewin that the boys are worth more to him alive than dead, and that so long as he doesn't fight, Hodor will be spared too. Even the reeds he agrees to spare, but he does intend to kill Osha, and Lewin is fine with that, calling her an oathbreaker. They find a deer that has been killed by the wolves, and Theon is a bit surprised that the humans didn't at least partially butcher the carcass. He presumes Osha is too afraid to light a fire. They reach a stream, and the hounds lose the scent. They notice a lack of Hodor's heavy footprint in the soft mud, and realize that they've been tricked. The wolves were alone, and the humans have peeled off somewhere else. The force splits into three. One group goes upstream, one down, and one backtracks to find the branch point. None of them are successful. The three parties reconvene, and Theon is wroth with all. Reek says that he has a hunch where they might be hiding. There is a mill nearby Winterfell, where Sir Roderick paused when Reek was being brought to Winterfell. The miller's wife had said several children whom Cassell played with. Reek shows Theon what he's brought along with him, furs and wool and a wolf's head brooch. Theon picks up what Reek is putting down and sends the rest of the party back to Winterfell. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. Oh boy, that Theon, I tell you what, he's quite the character. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so um, it's kind of what we, you know, more of the same from Theon in many ways. You know, he's, he's, he's simultaneously loving being the Lord of Winterfell, but he's sort of like oppressed by it because he's having to be horrible to people who he likes and who kind of liked him. You know, I don't think anyone loved Theon, but they, you know. They saw him grow up from a little boy. They have a fondness for him. Sure, they did anyway. They did, exactly. And he's he's burning all of that. And so... Right. Is the problem... Is, as you know, I've been watching Breaking Bad and it seems to me the problem with sort of like being a bad guy. If you're a successful bad guy, you become rich and sort of like powerful. And, and, and what's that a show for it? You know, nobody likes you right. anymore, you know? <laughs> that's right. really, maybe, what's maybe all that's that just, money worth maybe it's my what's, need to be loved coming through I don't understand bad guys <laughs> what, what, what's the point of all that wealth and power if you don't have friends to share it with right 
Right? That that's why we make this podcast. We yeah, scrupulously pretty... avoid wealth and power whilst <laughs> garnering friends. That's, that's right. We are wealthy in other ways. Exactly. More important ways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Theon likes the fact that he's despoiling the Stark marital bed. It's not exactly the worst thing he's done recently or on the long term, but it is emblematic of his nastiness and how he feels towards the Starks. But again, I I still feel some of it is kind of like he's trying to be like that. Yes. He actually was kind kind of fond of Ned and Kat. He was. Yeah. At least he outwardly said so while he was with them. Yeah. So he's... He is, as you said, despoiling the Stark marital bed with with a uh, young girl named Kyra, who I believe he mentions is eighteen. And this is actually the second time we've seen Kyra. Oh, really? Theon, yeah, Theon called out to her on their way through the Winter Town when Bran was taking Dancer out for a ride. Is the chapter where they met Osha in the oh, Wolfswood as they were riding through the Winter Town? He called out to her, and then. He said some things to Rob, and Rob was like, Shh, not in front of Bran. Okay. Don't, uh, don't so, say inappropriate things in front of Bran. So did the inappropriate things he said suggest that he was already in a relationship with her? or Well, that he had been or he had intimate had with her. Anyway. Relation. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. I exactly. see. They uh, very much did. Well, well, that's interesting, actually, because that then gives a slightly different... Because it... Because the book, this chapter, I didn't realize Kyra was a returning character, mentions that she was keen to come to Theon's bed. And I was like, it's interesting that he's got one fan, but apparently it was an old friend, you know. Right, an old friend. Yes, and he hasn't uh, spurned yet. Yeah. Like he has pretty much all of his other friends. Right. But like you're saying, throughout all of Theon's POVs, we see such mixed feelings and emotions about Ned. Like you... Like you said, he seems to want to rule like Ned. He often mentions that he, you know, he will rule like Ned or he's going to do something like Ned did something. But he also frequently wants to tear Ned down like he does here, kind of taking pleasure in the fact of betting a, as he puts it, a common tavern wench in Ned's bed. And so, so like when the wolves go missing, he thinks to himself, I must be cold and deliberate. As Lord Eddard. You know, he, he's channeling his Lord Eddard. He wants to be like Lord Eddard. And, uh, you know, he, he's made comments like way back in Cat 3 when she discovered... When, when w- it was the chapter with the uh, attack by the Cat's Paw on Bran. Okay. And then, you know, she, she woke up and she told uh, Roderick, Rob, and Theon about her idea that it had to have been the Lannisters involved... And um, he says Lord Eddard is like a second father to me right. when they're having this conversation. So, you know, in some ways he really wants to be like Ned. In other ways, he really wants to take jabs at Ned. Having now met Balin Greyjoy since that scene, being a second <laughs> father to him is not really that high of a, an You're honor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a second father to me. He's malicious, awful, horrible. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> now that's a good point right there. <laughs> and he also, I mean, you, you, you're making good points. He also likes wants to rule like Ned does, but he, he he does the exact opposite of what Ned does in almost all circumstances. You know, he like, does. <laughs> he, he uses violence and threats and blames the victims for having to kill the people, which is you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, he says things like like he's protecting them. You know, he often in this chapter talks to these people like he's protecting them from something or someone but it's him that has brought all of the problems that he now has to in quotes protect them from so but you know mixed emotions are probably not too uncommon when you're when you're dealing with a father figure who sets at the same time such a lofty standard and also expects you to uphold that standard when maybe your nature isn't necessarily to be able to do that, you know. So, yeah. so um, going back to Jojen's green dream before all this happened, he dreamt of the sea coming to Winterfell, and in it 
three people died, but only two of them died in the previous chapter. That was uh, Mikan and Alebelly, and sure enough, they did die. But Septon Chael was died in the dream, but was was hale and hearty when we left him. He, but he now was. we learned that he was pushed down the well after which which I've got to say. Why, if you're going to live there, why would you push someone down the well? I mean, his body's going to rot down there and pollute the water. Uh, solid point. If especially if you're afraid that you might be, uh, you know, surrounded and and besieged, why would you want to right. gum up one of your wells? Yeah, that I, could I, be an important. I thing. think that's a key part. Winterfell must have multiple wells because it's so huge. I guess, yeah, probably does. But Still. but you make a good point. Why would you? There's got to be other places you could have sacrificed him to the drowned god you know like i'm sure in the stables there there was you know a uh what are those things called yeah one of those <laughs> trench bucket oh, tr- yeah trough trough, trough of trough, water yeah. yeah that's the word i'm sure there was a trough they could have drowned him but in. listeners yeah, that wasn't in the notes, notes. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not in the notes we might him and hobbit <laughs> we'll be right back This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook, or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsharenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. So I I noticed that Theon's being guarded. The door to uh, Ned's chambers is... Ned's chambers. It's always going to be Ned's chambers. It doesn't matter how how many people take over Winterfell. They're Ned's chambers. Um, like Tyrion said, the uh, Stark will always be the Lord right. of Winterfell, Theon. So, so Theon's being guarded by Urzen, um, but that's interesting because he doesn't have enough men to guard the walls. So having to guard the walls himself and the princes, basically he had to leave one of these free, and that's how the princes got away. They couldn't have uh, Ironborn on every door. and so Yeah. Yeah. His logic is solid. I mean, you would want someone guarding you. Because you, you're not the uh, most favorite in this right. castle right you are, now. You so are you detestable. Might... <laughs> yes. And you need someone guarding the walls. And the boys are little boys. One of them is uh, a paraplegic. Right. So, you know, it, his logic makes sense. But you had mentioned, uh, I think it was the last brand chapter, of only manning the inner walls due to the shortage of people, which is exactly what he did he felt like it was too risky to put his men on the other side of the moat from him in case there was a uprising in the castle but i still think i still think it's tactically wrong to guard the inner wall i know the inner wall is taller so it sees over the outer wall but you must have a better view of the outside from the outer wall absolutely so there's only a 20 foot difference there's still 80 feet down to the ground right a lot of things could sneak up on you if you're not on that outer wall so I still think it's a little right. bit tactically weird. But that goes to how afraid he is of what could happen inside the walls of Winterfell. He wants his men yes, where they right. where they can reach him quickly. His men are very uh spread very thin on those walls. Right. He mean, mentions they, they must be working a lot of hours to, to keep yeah. running everything. I mean if they've got two and, on every gate, you know. Yeah, so he says they've got four at the main gate. And then six, including Squint, so now they're down to five, walking the walls. And he also mentions that there's significantly more turrets than men. And uh, considering the background of the last brand chapter, when I talked about the gates and the size of the castle and stuff, it's possible, it's, it's basically like not having anybody on the walls. Right. I mean, you're, you're looking at possibly like a one-to-one ratio between people and miles that they have to they they're responsible for right. along the wall. This is this is the point I'm trying to make. Given how thin they are, they might as well put four guys on the outer walls and just say, "You look north, you look south, you look east, you look west." Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. Send up a firing arrow if you if you see something, and we'll come running. You know. <laughs> now he does mention early in this chapter. He thinks I don't have enough men, and he wonders if Stig has made it to Deepwood Mott yet uh, with with news of what he's done here at Winterfell and with the request or maybe a command, depending on uh, how he worded it, of Asha 
to come from Deepwood Mott with reinforcements right. but, to help him hold this. But do you think better. she'll come? I mean, I mean, Theon's gone off book here, and oh yes, I, I'm not saying that I am born or sticklers for the rules, but she might not seeing anything in it for her and her men. Oh yeah, absolutely. On one hand. She probably doesn't like the idea of him trying to show her up right. by going off book and trying to take the heart of the North. And on the other hand, he would be out of her hair if she just let this castle fall and right. him be killed. And the, right. the, they wouldn't lose that many men. No, They've only got, they're down to like to 28 lose. now. <laughs> yeah. They sent Stig off, so they're down to like 27 <laughs> men now. <laughs> Stig arrives. He says, "Do you want to come to Winterfell, or can I just join your group?" <laughs> right. <laughs> um. So when they get to the scene of the escape, Theon does show that he's fairly smart. He puts the pieces of the scene together quite well from the scraps of information. Um, yeah. He notices that there's two cups in in, in the uh, gatehouse, and then Drennan's compromised position that doesn't exactly take sherlock like deductions here his pants were around his knees and there were honestly though that could have happened with only one cup present the second cup is actually <laughs> helpful for this deduction if you ask me the uh yeah, i i guess yeah that that's a good point he does spot the hastily wiped blood on the crenellation and that's how he discovers where squint was killed because they find squint floating in the moat right. and then he realizes what's happened and he he goes up onto the crenellation sees that there's blood there and realizes oh here's what happened he was up on the wall he heard the uh, gate go down went to go see what was happening was attacked by the wolves and then they they pushed him over or, or he may afterwards. have jumped to try and get away from them to be honest <laughs> maybe <laughs> Uh, and then later he notices that the elk only had wolf bites uh, taken out of it, no steaks cut from it, which he thought was odd because even if she, even if Osha was afraid to light a fire, she still should have taken some elk steaks for later. Yeah, yeah, that that was an interesting spot. And of course, given what we now know happens for the rest of the chapter, we realize why this was. It was because the wolves were all right. on their own. They they. She should have given them more specific instructions. If you kill an elk between here and the river, I want you to take this knife and then saw a bit <laughs> off to make it look like we were with you. Yes. That, uh, that but is... yeah, it is. It, Theon's quite clever. And it's a shame yeah. he's misdirecting that cleverness. Yeah. Uh, between him and Wex, noticing uh, that Hodor's footprints are missing from the soft mud, they've got a real like Holmes and Watson vibe <laughs> going on here. <laughs> he needs to give up this lordship thing and become a detective. Isn't it more like those two magicians? What are they called? Penn and Teller. Yes, maybe. <laughs> yes, right. It is <laughs> because Wex doesn't talk. This that was right. Yes, I I picked up what you were yeah, putting yeah, down. Exactly. <laughs> Theon thinks that he should have killed the wolves the day that he took the castle, and it's one of many shouldas. Uh should have done some things that he mentions or thinks about in this chapter. He he thinks that he should have killed the wolves. He thinks he should not have trusted Osha. And he thinks he should have put guards on the Stark boys. There's one shouldn't that he maybe wanted to think about earlier is maybe he shouldn't have tried to take and then hold an entire castle with 30 men. Yeah. And, and, but, and especially, you know. I, I, maybe this comes across more in the TV show, but I think I think it's it's been a background in the book that has been sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit. Is the thirty men don't really respect him very much either. True. So I'm not sure yeah. they're going to fight to the death for him. You know, sort of, especially if things start to go wrong. You know, I mean, he's just lost two more men. You know, right. if, if if things get a little bit hairy for him, they might all go off and join Asher. And and yeah, actually, by absolutely. the way, they they mention in this chapter. He feels like there's a Osha and Asher having similar names. He's like they remind yes. me of one another. They're always a pain in his backside, right? Which also explains why the TV show changed Asha's name to Yara, yes, right? To, to Yara. make it a little less yes. uh, complicated. Yeah. But I was thinking, with so few men, 
I mean, we just discussed how few men are guarding these walls. You'd think Lewin would be able to get some ravens off, especially at night, unless they unless they're spending a guard on him twenty four seven because uh, Theon doesn't trust him enough to leave him alone in the castle. He makes Lewin come with them on the hunt, uh, so maybe he's spending some of his precious guard capital but, to make sure that Lewin doesn't get but, any But literally what could he off. send? I mean I mean they they've they've sent ravens out to announce this to the Well they did. But they could get word out that how lightly it's held. True. And, you know the True. the situation within the castle when he got those birds off the I think it was the brand chapter when, I think it was a brand chapter when we the actual storming of the castle was a brand chapter. He got two ravens off. One was shot down. The other, I think, made it to White or was at least sent to White Harbor. Right. It just said, "Hey, we're under attack." Right. You get more ravens off saying, "There's basically nobody in here." Right. It's, right. There, this is being held together with, uh, you know, <laughs> chewing gum and <laughs> toothpicks. Yeah. I, I found it ironic that in this chapter, Theon thinks that. His father thought only in terms of conquest, but what good was it to take a kingdom if you could not hold it? I thought that was quite ironic, as he is trying desperately to hang on to this castle with a skeleton crew that really has no chance of hanging on to this castle if any force comes to free it. (laughs) So Theon tells the castle uh, citizens that Bran and Rickon have fled, and he wants help getting them back. Um... It, it, obviously, no one really jumps forward to do this. Not none of the none of the original citizens of uh, Winterfell, anyway. Uh, and well, I, I, I'm going to steal a point that you wrote down. If he was really committed to taking Winterfell, would he have killed Bran and Rickon? I mean, to be honest, right. keeping Bran and Rickon alive feels like a bargaining chip for when you lose Winterfell. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, if, if he really. If he really wanted to fully commit to this, he he would need to kill those boys at some point. Because as long as one Stark is living, he's never going to truly be the uh, Prince of Winterfell yeah. or whatever he called himself, the Prince of the North. Of course, Lord there is a short-term benefit in that it keeps the citizens in check because they know that their yes. princes are in Theon's clutches. Yes. And there is that medium term benefit of when Rob Stark arrives with 50,000 men, you're going to want to have a bargaining chip. But you're right. Absolutely. For the long term, there's no benefit in keeping these two alive. You need them dead. You need them dead and every other Stark dead. Otherwise, you're dead. Right. There's just. Th- you're right. There is a, there's a catch 22 there. He could. Keeping the boys alive keeps him in the short term safe because you know they because he could kill them if uh he's in danger but as long as they're alive he's never going to uh get what he wants so uh i mean in this chapter alone like farland says why would i care to hunt down my own trueborn lords and um theon even thinks to himself when he's thinking about the fact that the boys have escaped the people of the North will never deny Ned Stark's sons, Rob's brothers. The whole North will rally around them, yeah. and they will, you know, they will fight to be the ones that get to defend them. Yeah. So there are logical consequences of that thought, which one of them should be, "Let's go home," <laughs> because <laughs> we should not be here. We should not be. This was a bad idea. <laughs> the the only thing I wondered, and this didn't get mentioned in the Tyrion chapter, but I wonder if one thought might be to marry Sansa. Yeah. Because that might... It, it did. If you married Sansa, then you could, you know, become Lord of Winterfell because there's still stark blood in your children kind of thing. Right. And he does mention that he wishes Sansa or Arya were here because uh, then he could further cement his hold right. on the North yeah, by yeah. marrying but Sansa. He, but he, we don't but, think he said that to... Well, oh, what Tyr- Tyrion received his letter from Balin, right? Right, yes. So, you know, along those lines, we know that the Lannisters have a, a plot to marry 
Joffrey to Marjorie Tyrell now that they've sent Littlefinger off with the proposal for. So if the Lannisters were to consider the Greyjoy alliance proposal that you just mentioned that Balon sent Tyrion, would there be any sense to include some kind of alliance pact this you know marriage between Sansa and uh, Theon from from the Lannister perspective, would there be any would you know would there be any benefit to considering that? Well, the benefit would be conceivably that the the North might allow Theon to be their ruler if he married Sansa. Yes, that's the one benefit. Sure, it could stabilize the North. I guess so. I guess it would get at least uh, it would as long as Rob is alive. There's going to be contention, right? But it might at least stay Rob's hand. True, it might a lot longer. Yeah, I, I mean, it feels like the only way to win the North is to eradicate the Starks, marry into yeah. them, or let it be the Starks. I mean, that's from the Lannisters' perspective. That could that that's the only three possibilities, I would think. Right. I guess if Sansa was the only Stark left living, right. Right. It would be a benefit. It would be then. a benefit. If if Theon could somehow convince the Northerners that she was there willingly. Right. And he was actually treating her well and the children were being raised in the Stark tradition, maybe. Yeah. But he so he he's out he has everybody out in the yard. He he roused from their beds. Uh some of them don't even have clothes on, just blankets wrapped around them. And he tries to relate to them. Uh, to get them to give up what they know about the escape. Meanwhile, he's literally just threatened their lives, and he's got them up in the middle of the night. There's some of them are sobbing, and now he wants to talk like old buddies commiserating about the the fear of their boy's safety being lost out in the woods, and it it goes over like a lead balloon. Mm-hmm. So he cha- changes tack then, of course, and then he you know he's he's thinking to himself. They could have all been killed or all of the women raped if it wasn't for him holding back his men. You know, he's all doing all this for these ingrates. Yes. His, Poor Theon. The, the, uh, his delusion of why he should be accepted by these Winterfell small folk is really something to but behold. It's, but it's also <laughs> sort of like it's it's not consistent because half the time he's thinking they'll never accept me. And then the other half of the time, he's thinking, <laughs> these ingrates aren't accepting me. Yeah. He brought all the trouble in the first place. So when he says he's protecting them, he's only protecting them from what he brought to them. And yeah, you know, I mean, he's committed the most treacherous act you can to his only friend. And the the one he says in this chapter, the only Stark who ever treated me like a brother was Rob. And that's the the same person that he has completely uh, been a traitor to. And these people are aware of that. They watched him grow up as a brother to Rob. Yeah. And now they see him trying to steal his kingdom. So, yeah. I mean. He must realize yeah, that they hate him for this. And, and, and they've got every right to hate him for this. It, you know. But... Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I mean, somewhere in his subconscious, he's aware of it. Because he thinks, these people hate me. But yet, at the same time, he's like, why aren't they loving me? Why aren't they realizing what I'm doing for them? So, the boys and company are afoot. No horses are missing. So, it does feel like that's a slightly strange plan here. Because you could have got quite a long distance. You could have put some miles between you and Winterfell. But they didn't. Now, they did have this cunning plan of using the wolves to hide their tracks, yada, yada, yada. But, right. Which, um, yes, I'm with you on that. It seems like the plan was fairly well thought out and coordinated. There was multiple components to this master plan. Perhaps there were horses waiting for them at the point where they branched off from the wolves. Oh, yeah, that could be. That could be. There could have been another element that we're not aware of. Yeah. Not from within Winterfell, but from without, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because Rickon's four, and yes, he is a Stark, so nearly a man grown, (laughs) but his legs are only so long. His legs are not a man's grown. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But I thought that that detail, the fact that there were no horses involved, at least not that we're aware of, 
I thought it probably should have struck Theon as a bit odd or suspicious. And he might have thought, huh, something's going on here. I got to keep an eye out for something unusual because this makes no sense. Why would they go out on foot? Yeah. But I think he was just too confident about his abilities to track them down to really think about any anything like that. Yeah. So th- one of the few people to volunteer to help hunt them down is L- uh, little Walder Frey. Uh, you, it takes a lot to stand out as a cad in, in the amongst the people of Winterfell right now. But <laughs> young, young, young Walder Frey has come up with the goods here. He has. Uh... Yes. <laughs> and we assume that it's little Walder Frey. It's never actually I it stated. Said it was little Walder. But maybe I just... And they just it. said Walder Frey, and then they said his cousin. Uh, I... Cousin made a comment. So, but the way he disparages the reeds, and, um, you know, later, toward the uh, end of this chapter, really makes you assume that it's Little Walder, right. because uh, he's the one that did that earlier when, when the reeds made their first appearance. Yeah. But, uh, the, so Theon, um, he, he recognized, it takes him a moment to recognize the boy. And at first I thought, well, how would he have recognized Little Walter? The Walters got there after Rob rode out. So why would he recognize him at all? But if you're wondering that same thing... I wasn't until you brought it up, but now I am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Theon arrived at the Twins with the report from uh, Brendan Blackfish Tully for Rob about the Lannisters' movements. So... He was there when Cat went in to meet with Walt with Lord Walter Frey. Right. So it's very possible that he met the two that were going to be heading to Winterfell. Yeah. Oh, well, they all look alike, right? The Freys have a certain look, so probably he recognized them as a Frey, you know. And could and, be that too. And probably <laughs> guessed his first name was Walder because it seems to be the name. You know? <laughs> There's about a, at least a fifty-fifty chance. You're Frey, right? You're Walder. <laughs> Walder. <laughs> um, so Reek is another one who joins sides, uh, who who does want to help Theon find the princes. He urges uh, Theon to strip off their skins, the people of Winterfell, to get the information that they need. But what information do you need? They went out the door. Hodor's carrying Bran. They've got the direwolves with them. What 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 are you going to yeah. tell them? I mean, what, what what could you possibly extract from these people? Some of them might have helped. It's true. Right. They're already out the door, out so the door, you can't right. foil the plot right. at this point. No. So, yeah. If there were horses missing too, maybe, you know, where did, which way did they go? But again, you follow them with your hounds, you know. I, I just don't see the point of terrorizing the people here. There's nothing to be gained. Right. Yeah, and th- again, Theon thinks, he says, as you mentioned earlier, there will be no uh, flaying of people in this in Winterfell, and he thinks that he's the only one protecting these people from the likes of Reek. <laughs> right. And he's hoping the people will realize this, but it's only because you put the danger there in the first place. Yeah. So once again, he's he's only looking at it from his own perspective, not from the larger perspective. Yeah. But then he mentions Reek as one of his own. He says he wants to bring some of his own men with him. And I thought that was noteworthy, considering um, he just met Reek. And especially after Osha seems to have broken her oath, which she made right after Reek made his. So uh, maybe Reek has has done some things to really prove to Theon that he's one of his. Suggesting flaying his enemies, (laughs) possibly one of them. Um, So what... (laughs) We have to be careful of a spoiler around the end of this chapter because it's not crystal clear what the plan is. But Reek right. had a plan from the get-go here, which was to bring with him some fur cloaks with a wolf's head brooch. So yes. um, we'll let we'll leave it to you guys to think about what, what it might mean. But it's interesting that he thought of it before they ever set off. He came prepared. Right. He didn't know what they were going to find when they got out there. Right. But some reason he brought wools and furs and a wolf head brooch. So I, you know, it got gets you wondering: Did he know that this was going to happen? Did he know what the plan was in some way? Well, the one thing I'll say is that it was always a contingency if they couldn't catch the boys. That's the thing. He never mentioned what was in his bag until they concluded we've lost them. We don't know where they are. That's true. So it's yeah, it yeah. was always a, a backup plan for that. 
So yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. So we'll have to see when they when they ride out. Um, Theon leaves the castle in the hands of Black Lauren, and he's told, "Do with it as you will. If I don't return, so uh, Black Lauren is not one of the nicer members of the Ironborn. So uh, no, that's a reason to, for everyone to hope that Theon gets back safely. In fact, the last we heard of Black Lauren. Uh, when they were on the stony shore and Theon was trying to uh, kind of puff Dagmir up a little bit, uh, talk him up to butter him up so that he'd go along with his plan. He uh, he told Dagmir that you're the, the most skilled swordsman and spearman on the Iron Islands. And Dagmir said, not anymore. And he mentioned three names. And one of them was Black Lauren right. as one of the most skilled swordsmen and spearmen and most feared and dreaded on the islands. So, yeah. yeah. Would not be great for him to be the new Lord of Winterfell. Yeah. So on the road, um, Theon thinks about the implications if Asher finds out about the uh, the boys' absconsion. And he yeah. thinks that he'd sooner have them dead than to be thought of as foolish, which certainly she will think him foolish if, she, if he allows these kids <laughs> to escape. Um, yes. He is absolutely terrified yeah. of Asha finding out about him losing these boys. He must mention it or think it to himself five times in this chapter. What is Asha going to think? What if Asha finds out? You know, <laughs> right? Well, but I mean, of course, he sees her as a rival for his father's affections and ultimately for the throne. So right. he he needs to not come second to her here and. Right now, he sees himself as having taken a step up above her because he took Winterfell while she was terrorizing Deepwood Mart. Yeah, but yeah, if she gets to Winterfell and she finds the debacle with uh, the most prized possession being Maester Lewin, she's going to turn around, <laughs> ride home, and tell everyone what an idiot her brother is. You know? Yeah, yeah. Probably going to say it was a bad idea to try and take a castle with not nearly enough right, men to hold right. it. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> Mr. Lewin, a surprise possession. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> who <laughs> else is there? Like, Old man. And we've got the kennel master's daughter. <laughs> oh, so, man. Lewin, coming back to Lewin, actually, he's actually giving Theon good counsel. I mean, as the maester ought to do to the lord of the, of the right. castle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's still no doubt where his loyalties lie. He makes no real uh, uh, pretense of not favoring the Starks. But no. In fact, it's very smart of the way that he plays on Theon's personal connections with the boys in Hodor. You know, any other conqueror, if this was Asha, she wouldn't care right. who the who uh, Hodor is, and you know. Um, so he uses what he has at his hands here: the fact that there's a personal connection between Theon and these people. So, um, but Theon says. The boys have more value to me alive than dead. Right. So, you know, he's he's not planning on yeah. killing them at this point anyway. Yeah. But like we've discussed earlier, there's the catch-22. Yes, yes. The short-term, he needs to keep them alive. Long-term, he cannot survive as Lord of the North with them still alive. Unless he can somehow yeah. keep them forever as, you know, hostages. But that just seems... Right, which seems unlikely. Right. I, he, I he hasn't think. managed to get through a week, and they're both children. <laughs> They've already escaped <laughs> at once. <laughs> um, yeah. The, but then Lewin... So Lewin tries to make sure that the boys in Hodor will be safe, but he totally abandons Osha as an oath-breaker. And it, I couldn't decide if that was a sort of Ned-like inflexibility from Lewin, or just a lack of care for Osha or was he just trying to make, you know, sort of palliate what he was asking Theon for with this sort of like other side of it, you know, I'm sure you're going to want to kill someone for this. Well, the person to kill is Osha because she's betrayed. Right. You know? Yeah. That very well could be. I thought maybe it was him not wanting to push Theon too far. Right, 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 he'd, right. He'd already gotten the Stark boys, the Reeds and Hodor. And he was, it, you know, when Theon made it clear, don't even try to convince me not to kill Osha. Right. Uh, he was like, okay. But okay. the one thing I will say is it also would make sense if Lewin was confident they were going to escape. 
Flume was confident they were going to escape, that he sounds more plausible saying that. If he sure. thinks they might yes. get captured, he might not say that because he doesn't actually want Osha to die. But he, maybe he's been involved in the planning of this and is confident they'll get away. Yes, that's Allowing a very good point. Allowing him to talk yeah. the talk. Right, yeah. It makes him much more credible if he right. doesn't look like he only has the Stark boy's interest at heart. Yeah. But, you know, you mentioned that Lewin is giving good counsel here, which I agree, he definitely does. But, like, the the perfect opposition to Lewin's good counsel is Reek's flay them all <laughs> council so you know you've got this good wholesome council coming from lewin on one side and reeks um uh, you know let's terrorize these people council so it's just you know it's you've got uh two very different voices yeah, yeah, yeah. coming into uh theon's, on ears theon's here, shoulders so. yes so so wex pike who we mentioned is theon squire so just a reminder of who he was he was sargon botley's bastard child he became theon squire as part of the deal that gave theon Swain botley's horse smiler on the iron island so remember he was riding around on a horse called smiler um, wex is right. mute but he seems like quite a sharp kid um it was he as you mentioned that noticed the lack of hodor's footsteps at the river in the soft mud they could see the wolf's footsteps but hodor's which obviously would be heavier especially because he's carrying bran um had left no footprints he had not been there All right so uh yeah he also just one thing I, I read back on wex when we saw him before we saw him when asher played the trick on theon pretending not to be someone right. else and wex knew all along and kind of laughed at theon and got smacked around the head for it so <laughs> yes. i kind of like wex and i i, I i'm going to keep an eye on him for the future yeah and you know he's probably also a voice in Theon's ears, but not his ears per no, se. No, we're... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to listen to him, I tell you that for free. <laughs> well, things do not go well during the hunt. They come up empty handed, and Theon thinks if he comes back to Winterfell without the boys, he might as well just show up wearing Motley. <laughs> and it's definitely, it's a not a good look being outsmarted by that particular party, which contains Hodor. And for children. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's it's not going to help him on any of the fronts. The, the Winterfell people, the North at large, and the Ironborn, including his family, are all uh, you know probably going to look at him differently if he fails so miserably at this. Yeah. I mean, he, he was overconfident that he was going to catch them, but I kind of understood it. You know, they were on foot. And even if they had horses waiting for them outside, he was going to be on horseback and he wasn't a child. And they had tracking dogs. They were going to catch them, apart from this trick, which somehow has got them away. Yeah, it it fits with the standard process that Theon goes through. He begins with an overestimated optimism for himself and full over overconfidence in his abilities. And then things just go poorly for him we saw it when he arrived at pike and he thought he was going to be the new prince and it turned out that his dad uh, had very little regard for him we saw it when he thought he was going to take winterfell and become the lord of the north and it was going to be no big deal that hasn't gone as he envisioned it and now we see it here with this hunting party so it just it seems to be the process that he goes through yeah, it's a good point, actually. I, um, I might look out for that. We, I remember that we felt that John chapters were often the same kind of, like, John makes silly pro- proclamations and then wiser heads tell him to behave himself yes. and he came back down. And that kind of happened over and over again on a pattern. There might be a pattern forming for Theon here as well. We'll keep an eye out for that. Right. So, yeah. so Reek thinks the boys are hiding at some random mill with the family who runs it. That He stopped there on the way to Winterfell. The only question is how he could know that. And again, this goes to you, can he trust anyone? Because maybe Reek knows where the boys are somehow. Right. Um, but Reek says that, he, that that answer is beyond knowing, which is kind of cryptic and not very helpful. I would, if I was the boss, I would be like, all right, I want straight answers every time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> that answer is not going to fly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in... The sack he's been carrying, he's got some clothing and a wolf head brooch. And Theon 
understands what this means. Uh, I we before we came on air, McKelly and I debated whether or not we could reveal this. Uh, I think we can, and McKelly thinks we can't, so we're not going to. But when you all write in and say, "Duh." <laughs> Well, there might be some folks out there who don't it, it, put these pieces together. It is hard. It's hard. As I read it, it didn't make it clear to me. But then as I thought about it afterwards. I was like, well, what else could it be? It's a it's a brooch with a wolf's head on it. It's a symbol of the Starks. Clothing. Okay. But it does seem that Reek is quite sharp and uh, quite a it does. Yeah. So it, do, it does explain perhaps why Ramsay Snow kept him around because... Uh, Despite his malodorousness, because he's just, <laughs> right, he's got yes. some good ideas. He does. It's it's a little bit surprising that this guy whose name is Reek is quite clever and yeah. you know, seems to think things through and think ahead pretty well. I see. Apparently, thinks ahead further than Theon does. Right, and and especially like like we said, especially because this was a a contingency that he was coming up with, not just the. This is what we will do. It was like, a, if things go a certain way, we'll need this, and I'll bring it just in case. Right. You know, that that takes an extra level yeah. of, uh, of of uh, planning there. But then the chapter ends with with Lewin reminding Theon of his promise of mercy to the boys, and Theon says that was this morning. That was before they made me angry, which is rather ominous for the safety of the Stark boys, but. Unless this brooch in some way proved to Theon that the boys did indeed go to the mill, if he doesn't have them, he can't harm them. True. So. True. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Do you have some background we'll for see. us? I do have some background. I had to dig a little bit, but I came up with something. You always so do. So Theon told. Was that? You always do. <laughs> I I uh I try my best anyway. So Theon told uh Septon Shale that he and his gods had no place in Winterfell now before they pushed him into the well as a sacrifice to the drowned gods. And that is true. The faith of the seven is not very prevalent on the Iron Islands. The vast majority of the Ironborn worship the drowned god. However, that's not always been the case necessarily. Once upon a time there was a king of the Iron Islands known as Harmon Hor II, a.k.a. Harmon the Haggler. Now, Harmon spent his youth as a ward uh, of House Lannister in Casterly Rock. He was a big fan of travel. In fact, Harmon was thought to be the first king of the Iron Islands to visit the mainland of Westeros in peace. And when he became king, he married Lady Lelia Lannister, who was the daughter of the King of the Rock, which I think might make her Princess Lelia, but mm -hmm. whatever. At first, King Harmon followed the both the Drowned God and the Faith of the Seven, referring to the Eight Gods rather than the Seven, considering the Drowned God as the Eighth God. However, after opposition from Septons and priests of the Drowned God, Harmon relented and claimed the Drowned God was actually an aspect of the Stranger. Mm. As his kids were raised... In the Faith of the Seven, when his oldest son Harmon the Third, aka Harmon the Handsome, succeeded that's that him Lannister on the blood. That's right. Yep. Yeah. They bet he had golden locks mm -hmm. too. Uh, when he succeeded him on the Seastone Chair, he continued the practice of worshiping the Seven. However, Harmon the Third took things a step further. He outlawed reaving and taking salt wives, and he opposed the taking of thralls. That move, those moves did not sit well with many of the Ironborn. A, a priest of the Drowned God, known as Shrike, led a rebellion, and Harmon was not just dethroned, but his body was mutilated, having his, he his eyes, tongue, and nose removed. Eww. Harmon's brother, Hagon, Hor, took the throne and restored traditional Ironborn practices after that. Harmon, still alive though disfigured, was confined to the dungeons of Hor Castle. Their mother, Lelia, was also mutilated and returned to Casterly Rock. This led to a war with House Lannister, and after seven years of fighting, the Westermen eventually conquered Great Wick. Sir Aubrey Krakal considered restoring Harmon to the throne, 
who had been rotting in a dungeon all this time and was now considerably less handsome. However, instead, he decided to give the gift of mercy to Harmon. Well, thank you. Interesting. I'd yeah. never heard that tale before. I, me either. I thought it was pretty yeah. pretty cool. So, comparison with the television show, uh, we watch the escape happen. This is not from Theon's perspective. We actually see the escape happen, including Osha seducing the guard. And in fact, it was Osha that was sleeping with Theon. She sneaks out of Theon's bed, seduces the guard, kills him. Um, wow, she's busy. Again, and so when Theon awakes, his bed is empty, and that's his first suspicion in the show. Okay, I follow it. Yep. Again, the Reeds have not joined the show yet, so it's just the foursome, Bran, Rick, and Hodor, and Osha, plus the two direwolves. Uh, the whole Theon trying to win over the citizens aspect is skipped. He beats up one of his men for allowing the escape. Black Lauren, in fact, is who he beats up. And it's just him, Lewin, and the Ironborn hunting. There's no sort of like debating with the people of Winterfell. Um, All right. He does have the conversation with Lewin about not killing the children. There is no reek. Indeed, Ramsay Snow is still alive in the TV show. Um, because just recently, Roose Bolton was talking about uh, appointing his bastard to some position somewhere. So he's still, uh, he's still alive in the TV show. Right. Okay. Uh, they happen upon the mill uh, together and they meet the Miller and family. Um, oh. And then Dagmer is there and he raises an eyebrow to suggest something to Theon, who then sends Lewin back home. So the same plan okay. is hatching, but uh, Reek was not there to suggest it. All right. So, Good stuff. Pedantry, um, it's a, just a character decision, and character decisions are always those per characters' decisions. But if Theon's been there for a few days and the wolves have howled relentlessly, I'd be surprised if he hadn't already killed them. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> Either muzzle those wolves or and you know what? take them out. The citizens of Winterfell would not rise up against him for that. They'd be like, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. Thank the gods. <laughs> but yeah, it's a character decision. You know, maybe he just felt right. that he should keep the dials around. But the one... Very astute penetry. I like that. Uh -huh. The <laughs> other one I had was the butchering the deer, the butchering the elk. So um, they were an hour outside the walls of Winterfell when that elk was brought down by the direwolves. Do you not think they might have packed just a little bit of food for this journey? They're <laughs> hungry least, already? At least How many times have they a stopped? Light, <laughs> a light picnic or something. Right. <laughs> I mean, Hodo's a big fella. He can get through a bit, but, you know. Hodo saw the elk. He was like, oh, come on, let's stop. Come on. We need to eat. It's been an hour. So an hour. that just never made any sense to me that you you wouldn't need food at that point. And it's the direwolves. They'll kill deer all, and elk all along the way. You can get one later. That's that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. News and notes. George Martin has seen a rough cut of the first episode of House of Dragon and loved it. It's dark. It's powerful. It's visceral. Just the way I like my epic fantasy. So uh, right up there in the most anticipated shows of 2022. Along with Lord of the Rings, of course. Right. And they're going to yeah. be a good yeah, year for us one nerds. most anticipated show. <laughs> How about that? In 2022, the two most anticipated shows are House of the Dragon and Lord of the Rings. Well, yeah. Yeah. A lot of fantasy mm -hmm. uh, folks out there. Uh, in other news, just a reminder that Spotify is now allowing you to rate podcasts. So please, please go out and rate us on Spotify. Uh, other A Song of Ice and Fire podcasts are getting rates. We want to keep up with them. So No, we want to leave them in the dust is what we want to do. We want to leave them in the dust, exactly. We certainly don't want to fall behind them. So it's time for you all to do your part. 51% of our total listener base is on Spotify. Uh -uh. So get out there. Take but a second. Just swipe your finger across to five stars and... We will be forever grateful for that. That'd be great. So please, please do that right now while you're listening. So uh, rather than a review today, we we actually got a, li a listener email from a listener named Malaku, and uh, the subject line was: "If there was a great council for the best Game of Thrones podcast, you had my support." Oh, wow. So 
I, I would ensure that they were on that great council then. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so the message goes like this. First of all, I want to congratulate you guys on a great podcast. From the first minute I started listening to the prologue of Game of Thrones, I was convinced that I found the right podcast for the book series. I had tried a few of the others, but yours was the one standing out to me. That's fantastic. I I come from the Netherlands, so English is my second language, and I'm not perfect in speaking, reading, or writing English. Nevertheless, I started reading and finished the books in English, because in my opinion, it's so much better than when it's translated to Dutch. Therefore, I have missed some things that has happened in the books, and your podcast is helping me relive it and understand it so much better. I've also created a Discord account, so to join your community, and I'm looking forward to the episodes to come and join the conversation in Discord. So a big, big thanks from the Netherlands for your great work. Keep it up. Well, thank you, Malaku. That's awesome. We'll, we'll see you on the Discord server. That, that, uh, that'll that be yes. fun to catch up with you. Um, I will say, actually... Thank you very uh, much. The Like all Dutch people, they played down their quality of their English while delivering perfect English. I was thinking that while I was reading uh-huh. this. I was like, this is perfectly written. My my wife maintains 100% cast iron truth that Dutch people speak English better than English people do. She can't understand anything English people say. But Dutch people speak, <laughs> speak perfectly. They, they, so, yeah. Wow, yes. Well, it certainly holds true in this yeah. instance. So thank you very much. That was a beautiful email, Thanks, and yes. we really appreciate that. So let's conclude. So there's real trouble for Theon now. If he cannot recapture the boys, then his only leverage in the perilous ownership of Winterfell is gone. I mean, all he's got left is threats. You know? Yeah, at that point, what is preventing any par- uh, force from just doing whatever necessary right. i mean you know like just torch the place yep. to uh to get inside if necessary yeah so yeah reek's becoming a character he's smart and clearly fairly ruthless it seems i mean certainly what he was willing to do to extract pointless information out of people was pretty brutal yeah he seems much deeper than just some stinky yeah. small folk sidekick so like you said, you could see why Ramsey kept him around, why he seemed to be fond of him. He, he certainly seems more than just a a wallflower background character. Yeah. He he's starting to develop a persona of his own here. And uh Yeah, it also like you said, he's smart. So you know, he was the sidekick of the heir to the Dreadfort, so maybe he picked up some education along the way and as well. Certainly some brutality. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> just just did not pick up much in the way of hygiene, apparently. No. <laughs> so he, he's the polar opposite to Lewin. Um, so Theon's hearing awful advice and good advice. Um, and Theon, Lewin convinced Theon to spare the boys, but then once he got angry with them, he said all bets were off. He said that was before they made me angry. So, But again, he's still got to think about the the leverage that they bring him. and. Uh, I, I can't imagine killing the boys is the right thing to do here. But hey, no. POV characters are not safe. Right. Yes, we've we've come to learn that. That's for sure. It's very clever of Osha to mislead the hounds with the wolves. Of course, because the hounds... It, it didn't really occur to me as they were leaving, but the hounds would follow the wolves' smell. I mean, that's, that's the obvious smell to follow. And all you have right. to do is just and jump the f- off the path in a different direction and they would not notice you going because they followed that wolf smell. Yeah. And that is the smell that they were sent on. Right. Farland's he's, uh, Theon says, can they, are you sure they're not following the wrong wolves? And Farland says, no, they know the smell of Shaggy and Summer. So that's the scent that they were yeah. following. But I do wonder if it was all Osha on her own, little Walter thinks that the, the reeds, have some part to play in in all of this. He says that they're not like other people. And then Lewin agrees and says that Cranog men grew close to the children of the forest in the olden days. Mm-hmm. So, and that maybe there is some secret knowledge that these Cranog men have. So I don't know. Could, could little Walter be I've right? Been giving Osha too much credit, perhaps. Yes. Good point. I hadn't thought about the fact that Reeds might have been involved. So we don't and, want to say what Reek is suggesting with the furs, the, 
brooch. Uh, can it help? Uh, can it really benefit Theon? Uh, we'll have to see. And right, he, if it doesn't it doesn't seem to be a plan to get the boys back yet? Well, I don't know. Maybe 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 he's gonna um, hawk that brooch, and then they'll be outraged. At... <laughs> we'll said <laughs> that's brooch. my brooch. We'll said brooch for sale. <laughs> oh, it's drawn me out of my hiding place. I gotta have it. Right. <laughs> If Bran and Co. do escape, uh, what next for them? They appear to have eluded immediate right. recapture, but where do they go from here? Uh, Greywater Watch, The Wall, another northern town? Yeah, as long as one of the options isn't Deepwood Mott. That would be the bad Or choice. Moat Kalen. Yes, those, those are not the places to go. Yes. <laughs> right. But I, yeah, I wonder if maybe all of this happened when it did because Jojen had another dream or something, you know, that said... We got to do this, so we got to do this now. Like the the timing of it, interesting, could be yeah. based on a dream that Jojen has recently had. We don't know. We haven't uh, talked to Bran in a a few chapters, so we'll see. Yep. As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harrenhall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Discord. And there's three ways you can help us. Uh, first and foremost, go out and leave us a review. There's no better advertising than that. Secondly, you can buy some Absolutely. merch at ghostsofharrenhall.threadless.com. Or lastly, you could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at uh, www.buymeacoffee.com slash ghostsharrenhall. Uh, big thank you to those who've already become sustainers. Very good of you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.